Okay, I think it's time to get started. Um, welcome everybody. I'm Kim Laney. I'm your OLLI coordinator and thank you for joining us today at our brown bag presentation. And the, today's topic is the future of local media. Um, this year, OLLI at HSU is celebrating 15 years of lifelong learning on the North Coast. We have a great lineup of classes this spring and we want to encourage you to visit our website to learn more. Throughout the year, we will continue to celebrate our 15 years with many classes being offered for a low $15 fee for our OLLI members. If you are not a current OLLI member, we encourage you to, to join today and help us reach our annual goal of 1,000 new and returning members before June 30th. Over the past year, OLLI has transitioned to offering all of our courses and discussion groups online so that our members are able to stay connected while remaining safely at home. In addition to our brown bag presentations, another way to stay connected each week is with to attend the discussion groups, Let's Connect with Tracy Barnes Priestley. All of our brown bag presentations are made possible by the friends of Ollie at HSU. Thank you to everybody who has helped support our program. Please help to us to continue to provide these excellent community presentations by making a donation to Ollie at HSU today. This is the best way to contact us. Email is um, always the best way. Thank you. And quickly, before we get started, I wanted to remind you that when you do sign up for classes, it's helpful if you register early. Um, during busy times, there may be a delay due to the volume of people signing up for classes, and we want to make sure we get you your class um, link in a timely way. Following today's presentation, the Recording will be available on our website, and this is um, where on our website there's um, a, this. If you follow that arrow, you should be able to find the recording. It usually takes about um, one to two days to get those recordings up unloaded on our website. So we hope that you um, can find that easily. But if not, just um, shoot us an email and we will help you out. We're ready to get started. So if you haven't already, please mute yourself. Um, and keep yourself muted throughout the presentation, unless you're asking a question. And um, Sean has indicated that he's gonna do um, his presentation more in a conversation style. So if you do have questions, um, you can either raise your hand, you can put your question in the chat, or you can use the raise hand function, whichever um, works the best for you. And we will keep an eye on those questions and, and um, get those to Sean so that he can answer all your questions. Um, that is everything. And I just want to thank you again for staying connected. And um, Jane is going to go ahead and introduce our guest today. Thank you. And welcome to everyone. And I'm delighted to welcome Sean, uh, who says he's a digital ecologist. And I think that would be fun for him to explain. Um, he serves as executive director of Access Humboldt and has for years and years where he's advocating for public policy to support universal access to open media, uh, obviously including Access Humboldt. And he's going to explain the kinds of things he's been doing and how we are very, how he is very diligently and strongly supporting our continued access. So welcome to Sean and off we go. Welcome to you all. Aloha, Jane and uh, Kim. Thank you so much for um, everybody for being here and taking some time to catch up and hopefully talk story about what you think the future of local media looks like. Um, I think we framed the topic to sort of entice discussion, really, and not make it a lecture about you know what I think that might look like, although I could, I'd certainly love to do a series like that, but you would not like to attend it, I would, wouldn't expect. But um, <clears throat> I did share in, in the chat a document that I just wanna point to because what I promised to do is keep populating that with more links and uh, background information. And it's, um, it's just basically an outline for this talk that I'm gonna use right now. And, um, I don't know if folks don't have access to uh, to that or would prefer uh, I can share that, but it's just text at this point. So I'll just I'll just talk about it and um, 
to set the stage for folks who don't know, um, a little bit about me, I guess, is that I was, uh, fate delivered me here, I guess, uh, you might say, quite a while back, uh, directly from Hawaii, where I'd been involved doing very similar work, which was finding the resources through the cable TV system to secure channels and um, production resources and funding for local voices uh, over community media. And to then extend that out to radio. And um, it was not that hard at the time, really, to identify the need because people could recognize pretty quickly um, that there was local information that wasn't making it onto their TV. <laughs> um, and so Access Humboldt was formed really as part of a national movement to where local communities recognized that they could take these measures under the uh, federal and state laws. Uh, local governments had the ability to negotiate with the cable company and set aside channels and resources. So uh, I can talk more about that dynamic, but the story for Humboldt really comes when probably a lot of folks on, uh, you know, that you know were involved with this visioning that said, what if we organize the county and the cities all together and they collectively bargain, negotiate with Cox Cable um, because they're gonna need everybody's permission to tear up the streets and run cables and wires over all the poles, ducts and conduits that are built on public property that are acquired and maintained at local taxpayer expense. That was the structure of the law. So um, that negotiation occurred at the same time that Cox sold the cable system to Suddenlink, um, which had a different owner at the time uh, based out of Kansas City. Uh, and um, so that negotiation occurred and there was this big infusion of resources locally in Humboldt County that represent, were represented by what we manage now, which is the creation of a new organization, Access Humboldt, and uh, channels on the cable system. Um, we subsequently have launched a community radio station at 96.7 FM in Eureka, and an online collection of local content on the Internet Archive. And then part of that franchise deal was also having dedicated fiber optic links between the media center and 20 other sites around the county, including the city halls and community centers, the library locations. And um, there was a very specific map of that. And then there was a significant chunk of money, chunk of money to fund the development of a community media center with the studio and equipment needed to um, operate five channels over the cable system, four on Suddenlink and one for Southern Humboldt and another related system and launch a whole bunch of new programs and services. So why don't I take a breath there and just check in and ask uh, if, there's, if there are any questions that, you know, or if it, Anybody wants to add to that history? Like I said, some folks on this call were here before I, before I was and were more involved. If I needed to give credit to one person who made it possible for me to do my best here, it would be Tracy Jordan French, um, who I happen to uh, see here on this call. Um, but anyway, shout out to Tracy. But it's obviously a team effort. I mean, it's not, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to turn it into a personality discussion, but this community decided that this was important. And politically, all these jurisdictions aligned, they wrote their laws together and they basically worked together. And it's not that common for county and six cities to pull together and build something like this. So that's- When was that, Sean? Uh, that would have been, well, it, the stage was set for me to arrive 15 years ago. So um, right about that before horizon. Before that, they, they were doing this work beforehand? Yeah, that would by piece, piecemeal. So Arcata has its own storied history uh, that involved um, some controversy. And I think the city recognized that, um, and this is part of the legal framework that you don't want the city itself running this. You need a third party. You need an intermediary. You need to create a nonprofit for this purpose. So Access Humboldt was really designed 
that is a best practice. And if you look at our board of directors, it's, you know, it's designated members to represent segments of our community, education sector, the government sector, the nonprofit sector, and the membership generally. So there's this really interesting design in the whole organization. It looks a lot like a joint powers authority, but it's not. It's a private 501c3. Um, behaves like a public agency in terms of openness and transparency and um, our presumption of accountability. So, um, so those are some of the, I, I guess I would describe those as our, our hard assets and our ongoing expectations of service and what we do, the channels, the media center, radio station, you know, production and distribution. I'd say what's a little different about um, access compared to like broadcasting is um, there aren't those obligations that broadcasters have for um, curating the content. That is, at cable access was early into the game of unfiltered content. I have to say that used to be more dramatic back in the day, but now with YouTube and the stuff you can find online, it's not like access is any, any uh, more out there than what you can find on the internet. Um, so that has all changed in the time that you know, we've been doing this work, really. That shift has occurred. And I think that's the big conversation here is um, old media, new media, and the way that we interact with the media itself. In the old media, we selected from streams of content that were available. And if it was media other than books, which you can go and look up through your Dewey Decimal System, <laughs> uh, and thank, thank God for libraries, um, and other kinds of print material, but in the, on, in the broadcast space, you had linear channels. That is, you receive it, you select, but somebody else is a gatekeeper. That stream of content is curated, it's designed, it's typically fun, the funding of it is pretty clear. Most of the time in commercial media, your attention is what's funding it. That is, your attention is paying the bills. So the advertising, you'd say the advertising is paying for it, but what the advertising is paying the station for is your attention. So there's a dynamic that's built into commercial media at whatever level. But um, anyway, I, dig I digress a little there. That's the difference between commercial and non-commercial. But the difference between local and non-local has gotten more and more extreme over time. The trend that we see that's very clear, uh, I talk about old media, new media, in the old media and in the new media, uh, maybe a little less in the new media, but the old media structure is still in place. That is, the, it's very concentrated ownership. There's a control in place for the curation and distribution of content. Now, new media uh, is a completely different model in a way from the consumer's relationship to the media, to the information. Um, the, I assume there's a universe of content that's out there. It's available to me. I reach out into that universe of content and I pull down the content that I want when I want it. It live might be important to me or it might not. Um, if it exists, it's available to me now. And I choose when I watch what I watch. Um, that used to be radical. Now it's come, now that's how we, you know, that's how we watch TV is uh, on demand. Um, you don't wait for it to occur. You go and make it happen when you want it. So that's a very different relationship with the way that people um, use and interact with content. And I think that sounds a little abstract when you look at it from the media side of the equation, but when you look at it from the new perspective we have since the pandemic, it's like, uh, if you're not connected, uh, anyway, uh, you, the difference is more stark. Anyway, I, I digress a little. Let me go back to um, make sure I cover this important ground, which is, so Access Humboldt arrives as a cable access voice. You know, we have channels on the cable system. We reach anybody with cable. Our first um, problem is, what if you don't have cable? Are you not entitled to this content? We're airing gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of local government meetings. We're all the free coverage for culture and arts. Um, it's available for free to the community, but only if you have cable. So we immediately started building online access and a collection online with the Community Media Archive. And we looked at issues like intellectual property. The problem with YouTube originally was a technical problem. Uh, it only had a time, it had a time limit and um, a quality limit of the file size. 
And it wasn't until later that now you can pretty much put anything you want on YouTube. Um, but it has still has a structural problem, which is it's monetized content. And it's also running through a commercial filter. That is um, the algorithms that are used to manage intellectual property online meet on online media outlets, even including like Instagram, will prevent you from using content that the algorithm doesn't think you have permission to use. Um, and that turns into a very important filter. Um, and I can talk about that separately. If you want to get into intellectual property, that's a different issue. But um, so what we realized for Access Humble, backing up, is that we really needed to reevaluate what is our mission going forward. It's not that old world anymore. The world is both old media and new media. And if you're only online, you're missing out on uh, more than a third of the population now. It used to be more than half. Now it's more than a third because that's the shrinking part. People who are using old media are older, they're lower income, and they're less educated by general um, demographic than people who are using new media who are better educated, younger, and um, wealthier. So the digital divide sort of in the media landscape was clear, and now it's become even more clear uh, as being online has become critical. So Access Humboldt has been trying to figure out, okay, what does, what's our best role? Where, where do we need to go in the future landscape? Um, and I, we lucked out. We happened to find, not even through a local connection, which you'd think we would have, but we found Internews. We found them through a pro program they were doing out of Philadelphia, where they put out a call for proposals for local news projects that Internews would support and it was being funded by a foundation in Philadelphia. So we applied and we had the good fortune of not getting selected for the grant. And instead we got selected by Internews as a partner that they wanted to work with directly without the intermediary of the foundation. So we basically scored a connection with Internews. And for folks who don't know Internews, it's a fascinating and just phenomenal organization that happens to have its administrative offices in Arcata. The programmatic offices are centered in Washington, D.C. and around the world, but they have a substantial uh, administrative presence, uh, office presence in Humboldt. So they partly wanted to work in a community where they have people working. Um, in any case, what we did was we found that Internews has been sort of redesigning some of their learning around the world in how to get communities a voice in media and develop those processes for domestic, that is US um, communities. It's called the Listening Post Collective. And um, one of the first steps they recommend for any of the projects that they work on is what's called an information ecosystem assessment, which is an active listening exercise to really look at how your community informs itself about issues that are important to your community. And very importantly to us, it focused on what are the, what is the media not covering? Uh, what voices are not being heard and what's needed to um, reach those voices. So we did this whole study that was released last, uh, not last summer, a summer of 2019 called the Eureka Information Ecosystem Assessment. And it was, a, like I said, an active listening exercise. It was um, very small. We didn't have the, a lot of resources. So we just really focused on Eureka, which happens to be the center of our media landscape. Uh, but, but we weren't just looking at media, we were looking at the community. So we did things like, you know, um, uh, ask people coming and going from WinCo, you know, what, where, the, what's important to them? Where do they get information? Um, what do they read? Where do they find out things? Who do they trust? What do they think is not being put in, in news? Went to the, the swap meet, went to a bunch of different locations and processes that you normally don't. We used focus groups and a, a series of processes to sort of evaluate. And we worked with local news, other local news outlets in the process. But we came up with a series of pretty simple recommendations 
that have really been guiding our work going forward in the development of a new project that we're calling Redwoods Listening Post. And um, the focus there is to de uh, develop sort of solution-oriented local news projects. Um, and I think one of the, I wanna highlight one particular part that hasn't come to fruition yet, but I'm so hopeful for it. And that is uh, collaborating with our public library system and developing uh, library facilities and resources for digital literacy and, uh, and voices and as local, as hyper-local information hubs, if you figure every library branch is a, is a hub of a community information system. Um, why don't I take a pause there and just see if I, uh, I haven't even seen your guys' faces. I'm looking at my, my notes. Any questions or comments uh, at this point? I realized uh, we did that information ecosystem assessment, you know, before the pandemic. So it's like, so what, you know, what, you know, and we actually had started to implement it just last, you know, a little over a year ago, just prior to the pandemic shifting the whole landscape. So it's been really fascinating to see um, how much of that has been applicable to our learning going forward. And, um, why don't I why don't I end my sort of rambling part and ask for a little more interaction here by saying one of the things that we do when we look at what we're our work is how are we actually how is the service that we're providing actually supporting our community in particular areas of need that we know our community has that are already publicly funded non-commercial areas and the, and so we we have broken it down into these five areas and it turns out that the first one has been the primary focus for the last year is public health and safety. And then the second is education. We work with every, educa every education institution in the county and every education enterprise in the county to um, advance their communication needs and interests. Economic and community development, you know, the investments that our community makes in our own community and informing those and resourcing those. Um, I will make a quick note that we're one of the few organizations that really is pushing hard on the linkage between open internet, uh, that is net neutrality, and local community development. That is some local small businesses rely upon an open internet to be able to compete in the online marketplace. Um, our fourth area is culture and arts. And I think this one is sort of obvious and I want to note that it's been very exciting for me in the last year to see, because we've been working on this for several years, but with very little traction, quite honestly. Uh, but in the last year, we've had amazing strides in getting a Spanish language programming produced and distributed through various outlets. Uh, we have a KZZH programming, we have on our, on our TV channels, on our online resources now, uh, a lot more um, programming in Spanish language in particular, but we're also doing Hmong language programming as well. Um, and, um, and the last but not least is civic engagement. And the note I wanna make here is, you know, we have spent so many years trying to help every little local jurisdiction record their meetings. And it's been a challenge because the cost of doing it and the old rules under the Sunshine Law did not allow for virtual meetings, did not allow for public meetings to be like this, where we're all in different locations and participating in a conversation. So it was not possible to have these meetings prior to the executive order that set aside or waived enforcement of parts of the Brown Act. So we have this new world now where imagine all of the public meetings that are occurring on Zoom all being recorded and archived and available somewhere. Imagine all that local information. Oh my God, it's amazing. Talk about civic engagement. It's too much. It's like drinking out of a fire hose. So I, um, I did want to share a little bit that this is, there's so many legal, uh, technical, uh, regulatory. I know Jane has encouraged me to talk about consumer point of view. People are obviously very frustrated at the lack of uh, competition in the market for uh, broadband internet access, broadband access. Um, we've had, uh, 
issues with retransmission of uh, local broadcast over cable and over satellite. So people are familiar with those issues. We have very specific work we're doing in advocacy with our uh, federal and state governments. Uh, there's legislation that we're working on now in the state level in particular uh, to uh, on the one hand fund broadband access and on another to give some jurisdiction back to the local government because uh, this is the piece that I skipped. In, at the same time that Access Homo was created and more than a dozen years ago, um, the state law was amended to prevent local governments from doing what Humboldt did. <laughs> that is, it's no longer the local government's jurisdiction to negotiate the benefits of a cable franchise. It's all done in a ministerial process through state uh, public utilities commission. So we have a, that's called the Digital Infrastructure Video Competition Act or DIVCA. So the legislation that's pending this year, SB 28, is actually a very constructive legislation that would start to give local governments back some of their jurisdiction in enforcing cable franchises. So that's an important piece that we're actually tracking very specifically. And I'll, I didn't put that in the notes, but I will put that in the notes for those of you who have that link for the shared Google Doc, I will add that. Sean, uh, yes. we were in danger of losing that control, weren't we, and losing our stations? Well, this is what happened with DIVCA, the Digital Infrastructure and Video Competition Act, was legislation proposed um, by, basically by AT&T and Comcast, by the large providers. And what they promised was, if you will get local governments out of the way, then we will have competition and everybody will have multiple video providers. So the theory was AT&T, for example, I live in Eureka, AT&T would have a fiber to my house and I would have a choice between Suddenlink and AT&T. Um, of course, that did not happen. But that was the promise they made back when they got that law introduced was if you would just get that local government out of the way, we would do it. So it never happened. They got local government out of the way, but the competition never arrived. So this review of that policy and saying, so, so that is the problem is that they did take that jurisdiction away. Today, the local government's hands are generally tied quite honestly in regard to cable franchise enforcement in terms of broadband access I have basically no jurisdiction or authority. We were, were grandfathered, is that right? Because we came in right before they passed that law. That's and correct. Then we had the ability to negotiate and we got our five channels, is that right? Correct. So we basically were able to retain the Access Humboldt's, uh, those assets that I described to you, the channels, the funding stream um, is ongoing. And so that's all grandfathered in. That's correct. The problem that we're seeing is, um, or the trend, the troubling trend we're seeing is that um, people are disconnecting from cable. They're, they're fed up with, they're paying too much and not getting enough value for the service. And the industry has really been squeezing consumers for more and more per consumer. So we've had a decline in subscribership, an increase in money per subscriber, but a decline in subscribership. So the trend line is making that whole business more and more fragile. From our point of view, you can't keep squeezing more money out of fewer and fewer people and have a sustainable enterprise. So it looks like um, cutting the cord, the phenomena of people no longer subscribing to cable TV um, will eventually be the demise of uh, our funding stream for cable access. So Access Humboldt's about uh, probably 75% of our funding, maybe 80% of our funding is coming through this cable franchise. So we're looking at our own revenue stream uh, declining over time. And that's part of our revisioning exercise. It's like, okay, so what else are we doing that's important? What kinds of services does the community need? If we went away, would we be missed? Or if we could do one more thing, what would it be? Um, so, but that is essentially the trend that we're dealing with now is cable TV is essentially going away over time as a discrete service and broadband internet access, broadband connections, connectivity to um, fast internet is, be, is taking its place. And that's why you're, you're increasingly focusing on streaming yourselves, your own product? That's correct. Well, we started doing that early uh, and the rationale there was, hey, this is a, we're managing resources that are, um, belong to the local residents who pay property taxes, basically, because this is a, a community asset. The cable company is using public property to build their system. They pay rent 
the rent that's collected should benefit the whole community, not just cable subscribers, right? So the benefits that we're managing are intended to benefit everyone. So beyond the cable channels, we've, we've been pushing hard to do build this archive collection. So we've got like 8,000 videos that you can get for free off of Internet Archive in the Access Humble Community Media Collection. Um, and I, I think I have the link in there. Um, so that is an example. The other thing that's new that we are doing now, and thanks for cueing me on that, Jane, is you can stream our chat. We have a channel that's streaming 24 seven. So you can go to accesshumble.net and then there's a, a tab up at the top streaming and there's a streaming channel now that you can watch anytime on Access Humble. Which so, of the four channels that we have up here does it access? In other words, it's what channel about eight. all the town meetings and, and yep. council meetings and things like that? Is that available? Yes. Stream? Yeah, it's channel eight. Uh, it, we're changing the we're changing the programming of the TV channels. Eight used to be strictly educational programming and a lot of outside programs, but what we're going to do is put every live government meeting will air on that stream. So the stream will will provide any programming of countywide interest. Yes. And when meetings are occurring at the same time, <laughs> you manage yeah. That. Well. The thing about that is uh, the, I guess the good news there is for folks who were trying to track these things is that those meetings are also typically either streaming on that jurisdiction's homepage, like the cities uh, and the county now have a, on their website, a live streaming page you can go to on their website. And so it's available there. Um, I think um, more and more the, inter the way people are using Zoom and interacting in virtual time and, and you know, uh, online and not needing to attend meetings. I don't know about you, but I'm spending a, no time in my car now and a lot more time in meetings for some reason. <laughs> uh, but uh, I guess that's the, that's the new world order. Could you explain a little bit more about internet and its function and, and what it does and, and why our engagement with internews is so valuable and how that benefits us locally? Um, sure. Um, I, I, I wish I was better qualified. I, I would say if you have the time to look at their website, there's a, <clears throat> the webs, the domestic programs are under a project called Listening Post Collective. And, um, they're just fascinating. They're from, there's like a half a dozen at least in California alone. And they're things like, how is the migrant worker community in Fresno, you know, getting their voice heard in the Central Valley, you know, is a project. Um, and then, or how is Capital Public Radio reaching out to communities that uh, are otherwise not being heard from in their area of coverage? Um, some very exciting uh, projects. Um, I guess I, I tend to get all misty about it because to me, they bring a special credibility because what, they've, what they're working on are programs that they've developed off of work internationally. That is, they've been out in the world building like a radio network for South Sudan, you know, or uh, helping uh, refugee communities um, deal with misinformation. They've been very activated in the whole uh, pandemic um, the misinformation and uh, lack of trust in information and sort of direct disinformation, uh, things that are occurring now in online information sharing, um, they have a expertise about that and how to reach very specific communities with actionable uh, health information, with ongoing news and uh, self-informing. Um, and for me, uh, uh, it's not a strictly US phenomena, this whole notion of humans needing to communicate. I don't know if folks who've heard me talk about this, we talk about Article 19 in the Universal De Declaration of Human Rights, you know, that everyone has a, has a right to, to be heard, to have a voice, you know, to be express their views and to hear information. So freedom of information and expression, you know, to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. Um, it's just a beautiful human rights statement. Um, easier said than done. <laughs> um, 
anyway, there's there's so much going on, and I, I know there's smart people on this call. So I guess I want to invite some other questions or comments, like the media ownership. That one thing I did not expect when I got here was how unique. And and actually, our study found this. We are in an information rich location. We are an oasis of healthy local news and information. So FYI. The, uh, the reason we're not uh, maybe all focused on this yet is we still have a newspaper. We still have weekly newspapers. Uh, we have lots of radio. Uh, we have two local news TV outlets. You know, that's freaking amazing. You know, <laughs> in the U.S., that's unheard of. So, um, so partly we're we're in a position to plan forward from a position of strength and doing the right things already. So I think that, I guess I didn't necessarily expect that. I didn't realize how bad it was everywhere else. <laughs> uh, but because you always working on, you know, making things better. So it was interesting to be reminded that we're actually in a very healthy place. Now, the flip side of that is when I got here 15 years ago, there were six local, locally owned TV stations and you could track down the owner and you sort of knew how to influence things because you knew who to talk to. <laughs> uh, now, nope, there's no local owners of those stations. Um, Sinclair, Sinclair, yeah, Sinclair, Sinclair bought four and then oh. a Cox Media Group, there's Cox again, but a different company, Cox Media Group owns two. So there's the six. I mean, um, how did that happen? Just out of curiosity, what? Well, there are layers. There are layers to it. Uh, one thing that happened that was that was you may have read about in the news is the um, FCC. The, so this is where federal policy kicks in, right? The FCC allowed it to occur, and it was not allowed in the past for any one company to own more than X percent. I think thirty percent of a U.S. market in local um, broadcast reach. So Sinclair was uh, limited. Um, they had already, there's other dynamics of why they had, why they were pushing the limit. That's a different question, but the limit was in place and broadcast ownership rules were um, standing. And then the, um, under the Trump uh, regime, uh, Ajit Pai, who was the chair of the FCC, uh, undertook a rule change and just said, oh, you know what? What about all these other stations we're counting as stations, but they're, they're not really stations. They're, they're UHF stations. They're not VHF stations. So we're only gonna count them as a fraction of a station. So they, um, so they started um, not counting UHF stations that had been counted. And that allowed for a much, much wider ownership across the country. And that was when Sinclair bought the stations here was the sort of a beginning shot of that whole process. Um, so our Congressman Huffman has been a leader and paying attention to these issues. And he actually introduced legislation to roll back the media ownership rule to what it was. And it would have required a divestiture by Sinclair of some of those stations. Um, Is it getting talk, anywhere? <laughs> well, this was, this was in the previous Congress. He's talking about reintroducing it and adding some other provisions, uh, particularly around this retransmission consent issue. Folks will remember uh, there was a period where the Cox owned TV stations. Um, is that Redwood News? Um, one of the local news outlets and other content um, was not allowing their programming to air on the cable because they weren't getting paid enough to do that. And so there's a whole um, media market relationship there between the broadcaster and the cable company. And as the consolidated ownership of the broadcast has occurred, those negotiations have changed more and more in favor of the broadcaster. So um, this issue of retransmission consent or um, a must carry uh, was the old policy was called must carry because we recognized how important it was for a local TV station to have a local audience on cable. And what was happening back in the day was the cable company bring in San Francisco station, you know, onto the cable instead of the local station. And so there was must carry, but then the industry shifted and they started making a lot of money off of charging cable subscribers to watch local broadcast TV. So my consumer advice is make sure you have an antenna, whether you're using it all the time or not, you might, you might need it sometime. So put a TV antenna on your, uh, on your property if you have the ability to do that and uh, find out what's available for free over the air. 
but that in turn endangers your cable subscriptions, which is your source of funding. And okay, and yes. Is there, is there a replacement source of funding for your cable funding that you could create that yeah, would keep Access Humboldt going? Thanks for looking out for me, Jane. Uh, <laughs> um, I would say I like <laughs> no. I would I would say yes. I mean, our our general argument is that there need to be for localism for local information to be supported. I mean, if you want gavel to gavel coverage of local government meetings, if you want free airtime for non commercial messages, for education, for public health and safety, for you know my, my list, then where are those resources coming from? Exactly is the question. And they can come through taxes and they can be paid for by those agencies to private providers. Or I'd say our general trend today is we need to be building our own public infrastructure. You know, we need to uh, ensure that we can connect to each other without needing to subscribe to um, Verizon or AT&T or Suddenlink or Cox or whoever. What does that look like, Sean? Well, in other communities, what it looks like is maybe the city setting up a um, open access network that would make it easy for neighborhood nodes to be set up with that have a connection to the internet, you know, that the backhaul is all sort of taken care of and set up in a way that you don't have to scale to do the whole community all at once. You can go sort of neighborhood by neighborhood. Um, I think those discussions are just starting. Uh, this is a little bit misty in the sense of we see in other communities where a city has built the municipal internet that it's cheaper and faster and better for the community than the private networks generally are. Um, Chattanooga, Tennessee is one of those big examples, but there are, there's probably a thousand of them around the country now where towns just realized, you know, we're dependent on AT&T, that's crazy, or whoever the provider in their area was. And so the community built its own, like, a, like building your own water. So if you have a water system, you have all the same tools in place. You have a billing system, you have a, a, a ground easement access to everybody's house, you can run wires. Uh, Places that have electric municipal electric utilities were early adopters, but if you think about it, um, there are lots of different ways to make it happen. I think the big exciting thing that's happening in Humboldt right now, if I look towards the future, is uh, in the broadband side. We've talked about middle mile, that is a connection between the consumer and the internet, you know, at a nearby node, the a middle. So for us in Humboldt, that would be Eureka to Reading, you know, or a Ukiah or um, up north if we could make that path happen. We have physical connections that you call the, mi the middle mile. But um, when you look at the global network, um, there's internet backbone, which is the long hauls that connect, you know, Hong Kong and New York and London and, you know, whatever, the actually rest in Virginia probably would be one of the hubs uh, in terms of internet. But um, it turns out that our Trans-Pacific uh, ocean easement from the old pulp mill is very attractive as a fiber optic landing site and that we are going to have multiple trans-pacific fibers landing here and in Arcata at an interconnection facility being available to interconnect with each other as well as any other network that's here. So we're not only going to have middle mile, we're going to have backbone infrastructure in right here um, within a couple of years. So I th I'd say maybe within a year. Um, so this is a, just a huge, exciting development. These things happen sort of in the background. You don't ne they don't necessarily want any publicity until it's done. Um, but really, we're, Humboldt is amazing. I mean, I, I mentioned that, you know, I still feel like a newbie. I've only been here, you know, I haven't, haven't been here 20 years yet. Um, but um, folks like Connie Stewart and the organizing that's happening with Humboldt State and the cities are, I think, very much looking at this issue of what can the city do to help people get internet? And one thing they can do is advance this backbone project. The next thing they can do is tap the backbone middle mile connections and make them available in locations around their cities. And particularly targeting areas that have not enough service or lack any competition at all. Like Who's really doing like, that work, Sean? Who's actually, is there a committee? Is there some sort of uh, group designated to tackle this issue and make sure we get these benefits? Is it coordinated with Huffman? How does it work? 
Uh, it's sort of multifaceted at this point. I would say um, there is a, um, at the state level, they have what they call regional consortia and the regional consortium for our areas, the Redwood Coast region consortium. And that would be Connie Stewart is the head of that. And Greg Foster and I are probably the three sort of people maintaining that consortium. Um, but in terms of in terms of the work, I'd say it's sort of ongoing. Uh, if you're interested, let me know, I can hook you up. Um, I don't think, like I said, some of it is sensitive conversations when you're dealing with new development work. I, I guess, you know, I, I tend to be a big, big mouth about these things and I get myself in trouble. So I sometimes I'm not invited to the really cool conversations. <laughs> um, but um, I'd say there's a, there's a whole bunch going on. I guess if, you're, if folks are interested, I would invite you to let me know and hook up with Access Humble. We have an ongoing conversation. We started a project, Digital Redwoods, you know, that, was, that is about this area. I think we continue to look for alternatives. We're partnering with them. I mean, HSU, think of it this way, because of the pandemic, first of all, there's a, they've more than tripled the amount of federal funding coming down the pipeline to subsidize low income, education, schools, libraries, healthcare. There's just huge amounts of new money that's flowing from the feds, from the state. The second part of that is schools and libraries and what we would describe as community anchor institutions, you know, fire stations and whatever. Um, those, the funding was very siloed to each of them. Like you can spend all this money to get fiber to the library. But then it was very, after that, it was very restricted. You couldn't share it with just anybody. You couldn't resell it. You couldn't you know, make it available at all. And with E-rate to the schools, same thing. They, they wouldn't they let it leave the campus. They had to turn it off at night so people wouldn't use it. I mean, it was that bad. The rules just didn't allow it. The technology allowed it, but the rules did not. So you have all this public funding going down these silos into very limited benefits. So what's happened since the pandemic is they flipped the rules and said, you know what? The problem for the rural health clinic is not enough bandwidth at the clinic. It's reaching the consumer at home. It's I can't do a Zoom consult with my patient because they don't have enough bandwidth. Well, especially while two of their kids are each on Zoom calls to school and their partners on Zoom call to work. <laughs> so all of a sudden we just hit the wall on, um, and realized you can't just, just fund community anchors. You have to let those community anchors turn around and make their connections available in their communities. So under the new legislation that just passed, the, uh, the, that last one with uh, 1.9 trillion, you know, embedded in that was uh, about a $7 billion of extra money for schools and libraries to provide service to their students and patrons beyond their facilities. That is just a, that's a sea change in the way we look at the importance of internet access and broadband. And the public funding now flows directly to the end users and not just to the institutions that they interact with. So, John, yes. I've been enamored of the idea of the post office providing a backbone. Is that uh, got any legs? God, I wish I wish it would. I, it comes up, you know. It, it might. You never know. It's 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 a it, it's brilliant in its simplicity, right? And the post office certainly has been uh, getting its own attention of needing to modernize. But it's I, not I, in the legislation. Seems like Ben Franklin in the twenty first century. <laughs> Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how, how that plays out. You know, it does look different in uh, remote rural areas than it does in high density urban environments. Um, the the post number... office in every every little community. That's you know, the it's beauty been of... there for a hundred years. Yeah, yeah, that's the beauty of that. That's the one that once the DeJoy got rid of. Ted, did you have a question? Unmute yourself. Ted, unmute yourself. Good, there you go. I'm fairly new in this area. And so it's kind of confusing to me what you're saying. Could you, <coughs> excuse me, could you describe the ideal 
system that you would be working toward. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. S sorry, Ted. I know I, I'm getting in the weeds really fast. Um, in, in my mind, the ideal local media ecosystem, let's say, would involve um, every person in that community being able to have their voice heard. That is, create your own spot, your own message, and share it in a location that's available to everyone. You'd be informed about what's happening at your most local meeting. So uh, let, me, let, me, let me paint a little picture. I, I don't know why I always want to use Willow Creek for this, because it just feels like it's so remote. But if I go to the, my lo to the library in Willow Creek, can I find out what's on the agenda for the community service district? What the, for the hospital district, for the school district, for all, can I find all my paths to engage in my community, you know, at my own local, locally? Now I used to think of that as a physical space and now it's more like as a network space. Maybe my library needs to have a channel of just that local information that's relevant to me in that footprint of the community, that sort of micro community that I live in, what's relevant to me. And can I set my own, um, I don't want to call it a filter, but if you think about the way social media platforms work by an algorithm, that is the, the platform that you're on tracks every request you ever make. And then it starts guessing what your next request is going to be, right? That's essentially what that's doing. Um, what if that was designed instead of taking money from your pocket to buy something, but to help you engage, to get your voice heard in the community. What if we applied that same intelligence to a different goal? <laughs> and sure. I would say that would be a model, a shift in the model. So I'm, I'm not sure I want my voice heard particularly, but if I did one, if I had an opinion about something, it might not be local or it might be national or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but aren't there ways that I can, like Oli, <laughs> I come here, but we, I express an opinion here once in a while. Mm -hmm. uh, so how else, what, what do people want to express their opinions about? Well, I think, um, I mean, that's, that's the, to me, that's the civic engagement piece is what I always focus on, but it might be a matter of hearing, uh, hearing information in my language and my native language is not English. And how can I get that information? Or it might be um, verifying that the information that I think I received is true or not, right? How can I verify information? How I think one- one of the things that we find in current research is that older folks like the Ollie crowd are more likely to pass along bad information, are less knowledgeable about how to vet whether information is true or not, and are more likely to share bad information. That's a, that's a sort of proven fact at this point that it's on us as elders to be sharing bad information. What's up with that? <laughs> I think what it points to, yeah, I don't, I wouldn't so sorry, Ted. Yeah, I do that is to listen to public radio. Okay, so I get I, what I think is reliable information that way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, unfortunately, NPR doesn't cover um, what's happening with your local police, and doesn't very often cover what's happening with your local police force. <laughs> For example, only... there's, a pro there's a project that's coming up in Arcata Bottoms to put up a big cannabis to, to get it authorized. And the Arcadia community wasn't notified because it's a county project going before the county planning commission. Um, so they didn't have to notify Arcadia people about this process. And if there are a lot of people now popping up saying, oh my God, I just heard about this. I wanna be able to participate in this decision. And they would, potentially have an easier way to do that through this kind of medium. Isn't that the idea, Sean? Yes, yes, it's the idea. In a way, and this is getting a little too more futuristic than I'm actually capable of, but I do think about this some, and that is um, 
you know, we need to take back our own ability to find and get information that we trust. And it turns out we trust local information more than non-local information. Um, we trust libraries, <clears throat> librarians among the most in terms of curators of information. Um, the more that we learn about media manipulation, if you think about what some countries are doing, I believe Norway has a whole program of teaching their youth about the hidden motivations in media and how if you really understood what the intention was behind that message, you might, you might um, consume that message differently. <laughs> And, and we, we need to teach media literacy. Yes, basically. exactly, exactly. To all of us. <laughs> well, there is a, a local newspaper here, I guess, right? Yeah, we, oh, have, yeah. A, well, we have several. Yeah, I see Carrie raising her hand. She would be able to answer that better than I can. And, and Karen, I don't know how do you want to manage I have a concern. I, um, these right-wing skinhead types that cause so much trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, isn't this something that they could kind of get a hold of and take advantage of? Get a hold of, what do you mean? Having the local information not, it wouldn't using, be as- using, wouldn't be the, as... using their freedom of contacting people to deliberately mislead people. Well, we certainly see that happening now. I, I'm not sure how much more of a liability there would be in a new in a new model. In my mind, if you, f for example, I think of it this way: um, if the local uh, t TV station airs something that I find objectionable, I can go physically to that location and I can interact with somebody there at that location. Um, now, I used to be able to go and check their public files. I used to be able to register my complaint with the FCC. I used to be able to have an actual mechanism that I could use locally to engage editorially with my TV station. I don't have that anymore, but I used to. Um, so I think we still have this reality that if it's locally owned, if there's a local voice involved, that it's more accountable to the local community just inherently. I, I don't know how to, I, this is maybe I'm just going on faith here. I don't know, but I honestly believe that if it's a local person behind it, that I can reach them. You know, they may not, they may not like, I may not like them. And, um, but I don't know if you know who owns our local radio outlets, but I do. And if I had a problem, I know who to talk to, right? I mean, that's not true in most of the country. <laughs> so we would be held more accountable because we are local. That's, that's why I lean into localism, media localism as the solution. And we have to design, you know, locally based solutions. Thanks. Sorry. I, and I, I do want to shout out, Carrie has been launching yeah. a new local journalism project, among other things, but go for it, Carrie. Well, and, and my question, I will confess, it's a little bit leading and self-serving, but also, um, also I'm truly interested. So it's a little of each, but um, when you're talking about your media, your perfect media ecosystem, it sounded like really a, a dream world for the uncurated content. But what about curated content where we have, we do have this abundance of small local outlets in print or online, Mm -hmm. Sadly, a lot, one of them now is hedge fund owned and a lot of them are um, resource poor for one reason or another, for COVID right. and before what's happening to ad dollars. What do you see as, and here's the self-serving piece, but, but what do you see as the role for, of nonprofit and um, foundation and other philanthropic giving for supporting more of curated journalism? Yeah, I think it's happening. I think that I think it, it's going to have to happen more and more. I mean, I think, for example, since the pandemic, I, I wasn't tracking this very closely before, but it's been a trend nationally that as local newspapers have closed, that local foundations have st stepped up and started to fund through foundation funding, you know, alternative news programs that aren't, you know, dependent on the commercial model that's failing. Um, towns like Longmont, Colorado have the library is now the home of the newspaper. So the newspaper comes out of the library. So it's publicly funded. So you have combinations of public funding and private nonprofit funding. I think those models are going to be essential. Um, I think um, you're right. I missed in my model, I missed saying that and there would be this intelligence added by the local news media because I think that the questions 
Uh, actually, if I take it another step farther, what we're trying to develop is the, in the Redwoods listening post is that every library, and maybe we can't, the pandemic has shifted our the frame on this, but at every library, there'd be a little recording spot where you could walk up and you'd say, here are today's questions. Today's questions brought to you by, you know, your local newspaper, your local TV station, your local radio station, your local supervisor, your local city council member, your local, you know, agenda for the thing. And you can comment on any of these if you want more information before you comment, click here and go find more information before you comment. It's always good to be informed before you speak, but you can record your three minutes of testimony right here on this camera with this microphone and hit send and we will deliver it to where it needs to go. It needs to go to the board of supervisors. It needs to go to the you know, community service district. It needs to go to the school board meeting or it needs to go to the newspaper. You're right. And I think what, what we've underestimated, what I have underestimated, quite honestly, in my life is the amount of work that journalists put in and the time and the intelligence that journalists add and the integrity of the journalistic ethic. I mean, we're always criticizing it around the edges, you know, that and I'm, it's easy to critique and I'm, I'm guilty of this. You know, it's like I wanted to remind everybody, guess what PBS is? It's a petroleum broadcasting service, you know, because everybody's serving the money, you know. Access Humboldt has to serve local governments. So, you know, we're compromised, you know, uh, on some level. And that's true for every commercial outlet structurally. But what makes it work is we've got these smart, committed journalists, you know, who actually will do the work, you know. And I'm, I'm going to, in your Willow Creek example, because it's so perfect. Mm -hmm. I mean, if everything in Willow Creek were made available, the minute, the, the live broadcast of all those special districts wouldn't it be great if there were a journalist who listened to them all, read the agendas, looked at what was hidden away on the consent calendar, and then wrote, instead of the five meetings you had to listen to, wrote one story a week of, oh my gosh, watch out for this Willow Creek. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How valuable would that be? It, and all the live things broadcast are wonderful for those who have the time and resources, but for those who are time poor, Yep. There's nothing like a you know a cur hyper local curated reporting. Yep, you're absolutely right, and that is the missing piece. I mean, I've always imagined we're creating all this raw material for these works of art to be created, but the raw material is not the artwork, is not the finished piece. You know, is not really very in a lot of cases not very usable by most people. But um, with the right thoughtful curation, I mean, people have. Here's an example. I met a new supervisor who just got elected and said, hey, come and meet with us and we'll show you around what we do and talk about what you do. And said, I know exactly what you guys do. I studied every, I went back through the archives and I studied every meeting and I followed these issues. And in fact, there's this one issue right now where a developer is committing this and that and damned if they didn't promise to do that before and they never did it, you know? And so they're finding in the record, you know, the accountability that we're talking about and making a difference. But so you're right, it, it's nice to have somebody do that in a thoughtful way for you, but you can also do it yourself. I mean, every activist group can go and pull from that raw material, the, you know, the story that they want to tell and can tell that story, you know, so yes. And. <laughs> John, haven't you also been collaborating with like the time standard and other uh, print media to help each other out? And what does that look like? Yeah, well, uh, we started, we took this Redwood Listening Post concept to the Humboldt Area Foundation and we pitched it to them as a, something that they should help us pursue. And uh, then the pandemic hit and they were in regroup mode. And this is how I learned for the first, I, I didn't realize that they were directly funding one of the news outlets, North Coast Journal gets direct funding from Humboldt Area Foundation for stories. And they branded it as the Community Voices Coalition Project, which we signed on to be part of. So. There has been some public funding, there has been some community foundation funding for local news work. Um, and from our side at Access Humboldt, we've tried to build a system that is shareable across every news outlet. And it is tricky because the news outlets are commercial competing with each other outlets. I mean, like we, we have an editorial review advisory group that includes a Lost Coast Outpost, includes North Coast Journal, uh, and includes time, you know, time, like you mentioned, Time Standard. Um, I mean, I think one of the beauties of Access Humboldt that I really appreciate is the ability to work across every group. I mean, we're not, we're charged with not uh, taking one position over another and being neutral in that sense. So 
Time Standard is a really good example. They, um, and each of these media outlets has their own challenge of revenue streams and who they reach and how they reach. And someone helped getting on TV, someone helped turning into radio, someone helped, you know, uh, reaching different communities, whatever it is. But um, so we have uh, been, well, I, I, sorry, I wanna follow up on your Time Standard question. So the Time Standard reached out to us and they said, you know, we're frustrated by the fact that um, you have, or we're not frustrated, but we see that Access Humboldt has this amazing treasure trove of local media content. It's like, we went to your archive site, we found 8,000 local videos, oh my God. Uh, and people don't know about you and that, that would be cool if they did. And you have all, and the latest local meetings and da 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 da. So, um, and we told them, well, we can't do anything exclusive. You know, we just, sorry, but we don't do exclusive deals but you're certainly welcome to it. And we would help you collaborate at the highest level and make anything happen that's possible, but it's gonna be shared. It's gonna to have to be shareable. So God bless him, John Richmond gets huge points for this. He went and negotiated with the parent company, the ability to develop a website outside of their paywall. So he has a, a landing page outside of the time standard paywall. So time, times-standard.com slash access Humboldt. Um, and it's the time standard access Humboldt splash page. <laughs> and it basically is just a cool, you can go there. Actually, I'll, I'll go get the link right now and, and paste it in, but it's, um, it links you to our live feed, our live stream, and then to our archive collection. And I think for them, it was a way for them to quite honestly, from a business point of view, to drive some traffic to their site, you know, outside the paywall, because they, they lose subscribers when, or they lose viewers, I should say, or readers because people hit a paywall and then they just don't come back. So they're giving them some content before they, you know, before they hit the paywall. So that I think from their side, that was a good thing. Uh, from our side, it's more reach and visibility for all that content because we're just generating that content all the time. And the more people who use it, the better to Carrie's point. If, if there was a healthier and a continually thriving, and there is a local news or, you know, happening, they would be using this raw material and our local news would be better because, is better because of it. You know, uh, people are accountable and reporters have access to the original material. And we do have some amazing journalism going on. Do you have, uh, I remember when we interviewed uh, John Richmond, well, he was, he gave a talk and he gave a presentation and part of what he shared was that they are now owned by a, con, a hedge fund. But uh, I asked him, of course, the inconvenient question of, do they affect your content? And the answer was no, they care about the fact that we stay in the black. As long as we're in the black, they let us do what we need to do. And we are not, they do not infringe on our content. That was very reassuring. And I'm not at all sure that that's what goes on with like corporations like Sinclair. Yes and no. Um, I think I want to encourage everybody on this, everybody who's listening that talk to reporters. If you see a story that did a good job, you know, let them know, hey, that was awesome. Thank you for the good coverage. If you see a story that's wrong, you know, reach out to them directly. You know, don't just grouse about it, you know, send them a note and say, hey, next time, let me know. I can give you better information because you missed something here. Um, my experience is we get a lot of young reporters who are new in there. I mean, uh, because the pay is not there and we're a very small market, certainly in broadcast TV, the churn is every three years. They do short contracts. So we're lucky if somebody stays longer, but that they, they pay attention to feedback. They want your feedback and they will, you can have an impact, you know, on, on the reporter. You might not have an impact on the, their, you know, their parent company, <clears throat> but um, I don't think, for example, the North Coast news people, um, I don't think they were really thrilled to be painted with that Sinclair brush. I don't think they appreciate the management trying to put words in their mouth and tell them the editorial positions they have to take. I think a lot of the actual journalists who work in some of those companies are, are doing everything they can to maintain independence in their news coverage. So, I guess it's an ongoing, it's e eternal vigilance strikes again. <laughs> if, if, do you have uh, suggestions in terms of what we, the public, <laughs> the elder public could do to help advocate for what 
needs to be done here locally? What, what would you like to see us do if we could to help your cause or the cause of local news? Uh, you know, I would just say participate. I mean, and, uh, and pay attention to what's happening where you are. Um, I think that every elected official eventually has an opportunity to do the right thing or the wrong thing. <clears throat> and um, so I think letting them know that you're, that you care about this. Uh, I would particularly pray uh, at the, at, for the moment, or, or I would praise Representative Huffman for his uh, focus on this and his work on this, but remind him it is important. I mean, it gets buried in every other thing it gets buried. Um, we have, uh, I would say, get involved with Access Humboldt because we do have regular ongoing conversations. We have some really cool new board members, or maybe not so new anymore, but like Molly Kate who's on this call is a Access Humboldt board member. And um, we have open, you know, we have open conversations. We, we, you know, we're really trying to figure out what are the ways, because it is confusing. I mean, I really appreciated Ted's comment. You know, the more it, any one of these aspects of our issues you get into it and it gets too complicated too fast and people care, but they don't know what they can do about it. So I would say, I'm sorry, I don't have a simple answer from this one call to tell you. It kind of depends on where you are and what your issue is. But if you're interested, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I'll share my email address. It's just sean at accesshumboldt.net um, and join Access Humboldt. We're very affordable. It's like $25 a year and you get a newsletter and you get access to some of our workshops and trainings and stuff. We're doing a meetup uh, uh, event on April 2nd, just for anybody who's interested. We used to do a media makers event too. Um, I will, uh, like, I, like I committed to, I will, sh I will um, update that document that I shared in the link. So there's a Google doc that still hasn't been updated that I will update uh, for, you, for everybody who's interested just by basically adding some more links for you. And, um, and I'll put my email address in there too. Um, but I, I'm sort of torn, quite honestly. I feel I, I, I have to say on a personal level, you know, I go from, I go from being despondent that technology is actually hurting us as a, as a species and that it's setting us back and that it's not really working out the way that we thought it would, <laughs> quite honestly. You know, I just like, it's a bad thing. And the less time people spend exposed to media, probably the healthier they're going to be. Um, so I go from that extreme to, you know, there's so many new tools and possibilities and there's so many new voices to be heard that we haven't heard yet. And there's so many ways that those voices can express themselves um, that, you know, I stay actually very hopeful about it. Um, that I think we're gonna see lots of exciting new things happen. Um, and I don't even know what they all are, but um, we're going to try to be part of it. I would say, as long as Access Humboldt's around, we're going to keep, you know, we're going to keep kicking. Um, I think there are some, uh, there are some, if you think about your own role, the other thing I would say is anybody who's involved with any other media outlet, let them know to play with the others well. Um, I will just, I, I hate to go here, but I would just mention we have a, we do have one broadcast station here that is, you know, nominally local, but actually is a franchise of a national um, PBS network. And they do occasionally manage to do some local content, but in, uh, in general, they are taking money out of our community and bringing us you know, programming from outside and not so much supporting local voices as they could. Um, so we keep offering to help them do that more and better and um, they don't appreciate it. <laughs> so I'll just be honest about that. Uh, but maybe if other people see openings for that, maybe I'm saying it wrong or maybe I'm seeing it wrong or maybe things have changed. But there's a really important asset in our community that is over the air TV, uh, which will continue to be free for people who have an antenna and can receive it. So radio um, and over the air TV, I think are sort of making a resurgence. In terms of the future, you might've thought they were going out. Those are actually coming back in my view. Um, There's a question in the um, chat. Is mm -hmm. there much of an Asian American Pacific Islander presence in Access Humboldt? Um, well, so, 
some of our staff uh, self-identifies as half uh, Asian Pacific Islander, um, but um, so that you'll hear me say aloha a lot because of my own roots. I'd say we probably have had programming from that community, uh, but our staff is very small. So um, in terms of presence in Access Humboldt, um, I, I, I guess I'd just say what, uh, whatever programming we receive, we, you know, we, we share that. Um, I, I personally have an, I have to say, I personally have an interest in particular, I've been talking to my friends doing messaging around COVID and there's been some very powerful messaging and I'll just share this as a little learning exercise because I'm, I used to make media a lot more and now I mostly theorize about managing it. But um, Taiwan had a really good uh, uh, example, I think for us, part of their response to COVID was they had, they identified within their, within this, uh, the federal government um, comedians who could help them develop messaging that would be both humorous and pro-social. And every time there was a negative um, sort of misinformation or gossip or some kind of thing came out like, hey, you know, they would spin it immediately into a joke that had a pro-social result. And it was just, a, to me, a, a, a smart thinking way to say, humans are communicators. You, you're not, we're never gonna come up with one solution that's gonna you know, solve the way we communicate with each other and everybody's gonna be happy. That's not gonna happen. <laughs> but uh, we could sure use a lot more health, pro-social humor. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, uh, I, guess I'll, I guess I'll share that. I don't know if that, uh, maybe that's my Pacific Islander. Um, my, my favorite, uh, on a Pacific Islands, I'll just say my favorite Hawaiian word because some people find it entertaining is ha'a ha'a. And ha'a ha'a means humility. So. Not too many have that in the media area, it seems sometimes. Although, although I do want to say, I think the pandemic, the combination of social change and pandemic has refocused and the rise of white nationalism and the threats to uh, diverse communities um, and in a place like Humboldt has really focused people's attention on what are the constructive uh, avenues available to me to support this, you know, the future that I want to see here. And on a personal level, I don't know why it hasn't happened already, <laughs> but it feels like we've been working on this for a long time. But anyway, sorry, I, I digress. But I, uh, but I guess I understand and appreciate that diversity, equity, inclusion, in the work that I do policy-wise, there's uh, money directed there to tribes in particular, to uh, black uh, education institutions and sp Hispanic serving institutions like Humboldt State. There's federal funding coming for broadband and inter internet access for those communities. There's digital inclusion resources very specifically about equity. Um, there's this whole phenomena which is clearly documented of a digital redlining that is, uh, the industry has invested network infrastructure in wealthy communities uh, above uh, lower income communities. <laughs> so things that don't surprise us are sort of being re-described with an equity lens. Um, I, do, I do sort of cross fertilize some of my policy work by participating in the Hawaii State the group called the Hawaii Broadband Hui and they have developed their whole statewide uh, plan around digital equity. And digital equity has really become sort of a, a framing for the work of uh, bridging the digital divide, helping people to adopt and become more literate in the new technology and to sort of uh, level uh, the playing field. Uh, Tracy will remember we worked with a group called Zero Divide, which was uh, philosophically very much aligned with that going back did I get my years right, Tracy? Is it 20 years or 18? Anyway, it seems like 20. But. I've noticed a lot of articles describing recently the uh, broadband extension work being done in the Native American communities, Hoopa, et cetera. That's very encouraging. The numbers they were extending to were seemed to me very small, like, you know, several hundred people or maybe a thousand. It's like, uh, there's got to be a lot more of them than that. So it's like, that seems limited, but at least but, it's a start. 
and you're going to see, and actually something folks might be interested in, there's, uh, there is a, I forget how much money, but the, many billions you know, for um, emergency broadband benefit. And it's a um, subsidy for low income, anybody who's on unemployment, actually, I believe, uh, maybe at a certain income cutoff, anybody who's had a Pell, has a Pell grant, anybody who is on food stamps or you know, otherwise meets other ge general criteria for lifeline service is the sort of traditional model. It's called lifeline. It's a subsidy for low income people to get internet access and telephone access. So they're extending that program it's called the Emergency Broadband Benefit. And probably in about a month or so, you're going to hear about it. And it's like $50 per person who qualifies. It'll be a discount off of their internet bill. So it'll be, uh, I believe Suddenlink is participating. I'm not sure about Frontier. So you have to find a participating provider and then you're eligible for a $50 per person or 75 per household discount. Um, so that's an exciting program. It, I'm not personally that excited about it, although because it's temporary and it's all just COVID related and it's all funding providers. <laughs> if you put that money into communities building their own networks, then I'd get excited. <laughs> and there is money in that. There are other pots of money for that. There's 10 billion and a treasury fund. There's another 7 billion for schools and libraries. And that's just federal money. Then there's going to be billions of state money as well, actually. So there's going to be, it's one of those times if people who've been around will uh, might remember these things uh, when the money precedes the, like there was all these amazing plans and they're scaled to be doable over time. And now all this money arrives. So all these plans that should not happen will get funded. Like we just recently, and actually I have to say it, some of the systems are not well developed. Uh, FCC recently did the, what's called the Rural Development Opportunity Fund, and they funded $800 million to Starlink, the satellite internet service provider, Elon Musk's company that hasn't even proven its ability and its affordability. It's $100 a month. Um, so like I said, on the policy side, I can critique that on the as a techno geek, I have to say, you should see these freaking devices. They're amazing. <laughs> I have one. It works. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'll tell you, uh, there's a couple comments in the uh, in the chat. There's one from Tracy um, clarifying the date for sure. Access Humboldt was created and okay. you moved from Hawaii to serve as the executive director in 2006. Okay, thanks, Tracy. <laughs> it just see, it seems longer. <laughs> and then um, Elaine asks, are there any organizations or people working on ways to bring ordinary cell phone service to the thousands of people who don't have it locally? Um, you mean just regular cell phone service? I, I, um, I think so. That's how I read it. It's a mixed bag. I'd say what's happening is uh, the trends that we're seeing are that the old copper network in rural, remote rural areas, the copper network is being abandoned. That is, it's too expensive to maintain a wire all the way to everybody's house. So they're being replaced with wireless service that looks a lot like cell phone, although it might be a dedicated point to point link. Um, I think today, if you're within a certain distance of the right tower, you can uh, sign up for internet service from T-Mobile and it's just a dedicated line of sight connection from the tower to your house, and then they turn it into a Wi-Fi signal. It's not cell phone service. Now, when you say cell phone, I guess what I wonder is functionality. Most people think of cell phone as it's able to serve you where on you where you are, as opposed to at your location. Whereas a wireline connection or a wireless connection that ends at a house turns into Wi-Fi, then it's like the area around me has a connection, but it's not like I can walk next door and still have my same connection, right? Whereas on a cell connection, I can because it's handing signals between cell towers. Anyway, there's a, one of the big developments nationally, if anybody's engineering, anybody wants to get more mystified, I would say, let's talk spectrum policy. <laughs> Allocation of spectrum to different users. Okay. That's being auctioned off, isn't it? Yep, exactly. Jane. You're on it. Yeah. 
there's been a, uh, I will just, my snitty comment is uh, the industry invented a marketing term called 5G as a means of freeing up huge swaths of spectrum for them to use for uh, commercial purposes. And it's not a real thing. It's a combination of things that basically are talking about faster, you know, faster, better internet using combinations of technology from millimeter wave to CBRS to whatever. There are concerns about that in terms of EMFs, aren't there? Or are there? Yes, the, the issue there, and uh, I, since I mentioned 5G, I'm sure I got s some interesting attention because um, five one of the descriptions of 5G in an urban environment, 5G is developed around millimeter wave technology which is high density uh, and fast rates, but only short distance. So that means basically almost every street light in a city will need an antenna on it to saturate that area with millimeter wave technology that would give every, you know, give you service in that area. Um, they're not even planning to deploy that in rural areas. And you talk to T-Mobile and Sprint and they say 5G deployment in rural, they start describing <laughs> other kinds of cellular data net upgrades, not millimeter wave. So yes and no. I mean, any, any spectrum, any cell site, any transmission site has electronic, uh, electromagnetic frequency radiation, right? Of different frequencies you have. Mm -hmm and all different frequencies, all different power rates. Some are directional, some are non-directional. Um, in the realm of, like I said, spectrum policy is, I love it because it's fascinating. You can learn forever and I'm, I'm not even an expert and I want to call every month with the national experts on it. And there's a list of about 10 proceedings at the FCC about different discrete bands of spectrum and who's trying to negotiate what price for them and what they're going to be used for. And repurposing naval radar and off the coast and all kinds of cool stuff. And like Starlink, I mentioned Starlink, the satellite service, the low earth orbiting satellites. You know how they communicate between satellites in space? They don't use spectrum. Well, they use spectrum, but it's light. They're using lasers to, to connect the satellites to each other. Anyway, it's, it's sci-fi. <laughs> uh, Ted has a question. Go ahead, Ted. Uh, I, I think we're talking today about local information. Yes. Uh, I don't have a lot of time to absorb, to listen to a radio and get a lot of local information. So I really need, I don't wanna hear everybody's opinion because I don't have time to hear them and I'm not really capable probably of sorting it all out. So I really need somebody to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and to have a small number of places, some place I can go, turn on the radio, tune it to the right frequency, and listen to the local news of the day for a half hour. And, and do you do you find that now, Ted? Do you find that somewhere? Where, where do you get your information now? I get uh, public radio. I do that on the radio. Uh, the BBC News. And uh, the, the, the PBS news hour in the evening, mm -hmm. those are my main sources. But and what, I, if there were some local place where I could get interesting, useful news, I would assign part of my day to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But just a part of my day, because I've got other stuff going on. You know, other folks might have suggestions for you, but um, uh, there's not a lot of, I mean, you got the TV newscasts, which I don't, I have to admit, I haven't watched for a while. Um, K Mud was doing a local newscast on radio. I, I don't know if the, does the, Are they? Um, does the Rika radio group do? Anyway, this is part of the inventory that I, I'm, I'm not, not as clear as I need to be, but. Is that what I should do to get? I don't know. I'm, I'm curious. What do other people think? Yeah, Patricia Ann put in the chat, and she's raising, in, yep. shaking her head. Six o'clock. Um, six o'clock on K Mud. Monday through Friday, right? I, I would. I mean, it's a it's a locally generated local, and it's focused on local news. 
whereas most of those ones you cite are not very local, right? I mean, does that solve this whole problem? I don't, it doesn't solve this whole problem. I'm just trying to help you, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> we do a little 20 minute or less wrap up with North Coast Journal about their, you know, a podcast, video podcast of their summary of their, if you don't want to read the whole thing, you can hear what the editors think are important highlights. We're starting a, Access Humboldt is starting a, uh, with Redwood's listing post and some help from a couple of some radio producers. We're doing a, a Redwood Community Voice, a Redwood Community News podcast. And the goal there is uh, we're going to be interviewing other news out, every other local news outlet about what they're doing and stories that they're working on. So it'll be almost like a news review of other local news outlets. So um, when will that go live? It's just starting. I, it's, uh, I'm hoping within the month, but I, I, I need to get that launch date. We're going to do, it'll be like a soft rollout um, and we're sort of building for it, but I, I don't know the answer, Ted. Uh, I, I think it, it's the right, you think your question is correct. I don't know the answer. I think it depends on who you are and what news and information you want. And we're, we're focused at the edges rather than the center. Maybe we need to focus more on the center. For example, we're working really hard to help Elenador, the Spanish language newspaper on campus to get their news story shared out uh, to the wider community um, on radio and on TV and you know, so forth. That might not help you, but it will help people who aren't finding Spanish language news. But Elenador is really so a solid publication, but they're not regular, they're not weekly. It's not easy to put out. <laughs> well, I, don't, I, 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 I have a lot of opinions. It'd be interesting to survey but, just this uh, group. Like, wants to hear them. I, right. I, mostly not local things that, that I don't know enough about the local situation. To well, like I subscribe to Mad River Union. I'm old school, so I get I want the paper copy. I get Mad River Union. Um, you know, I get the Time Standard delivered to my door. I pick up the North Coast Journal and I see it, and any other publication that you know Elenador if I go to a place that has Elenador if I have a place I keep it pretty Carrie, well did I miss one I'm sure I need to mention some other ones but yeah my question was just that that thing you're talking about rolling out in about a month could that be a podcast so there'd just be a quick here's what's going I mean I I subscribe to a lot of podcasts and um that might be a really cool way to deliver that yes Exactly, and it's designed to be a podcast. We're also videoing it so we can distribute it on the channel, on TV as well, but yes. Will it be daily or weekly? What's no, weekly, it'll be weekly. Oh. Well, get us, get us a link when you have it. I will, I mean, yeah. How will you, um, how will you let ordinary, boring, local people just know about it? Is it going to be on KMUD and KHSU local stuff, an advertisement or something, because I'm with Ted, um, I'm local, but ferreting out which bits to read. It's like, sorry, I read this whole meeting. And that's taken me half my day. Mm -hmm. I need to go for a walk or I'll go crazy. It's very difficult to get what you're talking about in large for mm -hmm. the local community. And I think, I mean, Ted is much more recent than I am here. Mm -hmm. But I think he's talking to not needing to hear the entire discussion, but having some vetted source mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that summarizes what's what we know to be accurate rather than not accurate. So that's my five cents for what it's worth. But I'd like yeah. to know when this thing comes out. I'd actually like to get the podcast, but how to find the podcast among the billions Okay, Jenny, I got to invite you to join Access Humble because we'll make sure it's in our monthly newsletter and but um, it's on it'll be on KZZH but um, sorry that may not it that, doesn't like help. Niche. See, everything's a niche yeah yeah no this is this is really for me I'm sorry I didn't mean to be talking about it particularly but I do feel like I'm an idiot I'm going to be going on 80 I am not stupid I know how to do a lot of this stuff I've become incredibly literate on digital media since the pandemic. I'm grateful for that, but I still find it extremely difficult and particularly locally. You're over my head, mm -hmm. several of you. You're very well educated already. I am not, but I am mm -hmm. among the public who would like to know. So, mm -hmm. 
Thanks, Jenny. That's actually really helpful. And to me, that's one of the high value um, propositions of working with the library is mm -hmm. that librarians are professionals at you know, information concierge or curator or research, you know, to help you vet and find. And if this is why in my vision, I imagine you would, the library would generate that, you know, sort of curated vetted resource. I have to say, you know, I, without too much focus on Access Humble, we start off being the anti-curation outlet, you know? So this is new, this is a sh big shift for Access Humble, uh, right? I mean, yeah. the idea of us being responsible curators, we don't like that role, you know? We don't trust anybody to curate. We're all about, you know, we're gate crashers. I mean, this was our old story. So this is a, re a serious reinvention. And I think um, a necessary one. I mean, I, as much as I love our old, our old model, I think, we see what happens with misinformation, with unvetted information, with the, you know, the kind of conspiracy theories and the way they propagate on algorithms, on platforms. And we recognize that we can't just be neutral anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's a very hard change to make. You're, you're going to have an opportunity to reach all of us uh, after this show is over. You're going to write some kind of summary and give it, your, your talk will be recorded, I guess. So can we have you give us a nice summary of how to get, uh, how to interact with uh, local news as a, a typical individual? Yes, I will. I'll do my best, Ted. I, I think that's an that's a never ending assignment, but I, I like it. I have to say, as Tracy's reminded me, I've only, it's been less than fifteen years, and. I have a hard time finding the Two Rivers Tribune, but it took, if you know about the Two Rivers Tribune, it depends on what you mean by local. Two Rivers Tribune was launched by the Hoopa tribe and it covers Trinity mm -hmm. and Klamath River issues. So you, so, could tell, you could tell, tell all that probably in one page. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, when I got here, Carrie might have something to say about this, but when I got here, I came from a city. And I was like, where's the local chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists? Where do all the journalists hang out and drink and talk, and talk story? Because this is where you go, you know, if you're in a city. And the sad news that I learned was there, there you, well, we used to do that, but we just we don't have time. We can't, we're too spread out. And, you know, there's not enough of us anymore. <clears throat> so I don't know. It seems like if we had a, something like a news council or a society of professional journalists, or I mean, the journalism department at HSU, I don't know. Well, how, do you, how do you start a thoughtful way to... Um, maybe you can go on Zoom, Sean. Yes. You can put together a Zoom group yeah. and set it up. Just go okay. for it. Yeah. That I don't know. I, I have never worked as a journalist anywhere where this did not happen with journalists at the bar late after the <laughs> many curse words and <laughs> vulgarity and um, frustration at whoever was paying the paycheck. <laughs> it, I mean, it kind of comes down to the local journalist preservation actions, you know, what's required to, to keep having working journalists live in our community, <laughs> you know, it's like, we need to take those measures now. Well, Oli might take this on. <laughs> you never know. We might take it on. Um, Julie also put Brett Hart days in the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I, I will say that we have try we continue to try to promote the role of the community foundation in looking across all the various needs in the whole society and the importance of being informed and how a healthier and better information ecosystem could make better use of our resources for healthcare, might improve our housing, you know, th there's lots of ways that information improves other aspects of work. So I, I, I don't wanna give up on the community foundation. I can't say I'm, I, they did fund, a, they have given us a round of funding. We'll be applying for another round of funding. I'm hopeful that they'll, uh, they have so many other demands on their resource. Uh, if anybody's interested in that part of it, the Knight Foundation does an annual convening called the Knight Media Forum. And I'll put that in my notes for you, Ted, <clears throat> um, about the future of local news and information and what is the, you know, if the commercial model is failing, which it appears to be, then, um, then what is the new model look like? How are we gonna get informed? 
and yeah, we that's... still don't really know. No. All right. I I find that uh, you just, the presentations here are interesting, but I could absolutely not tell all much detail what you talked about today mm -hmm. or what last week's talk was about. I, about I can say it was sub tell you subject subject. But any of the details gone. So that's, that's a problem of, of aging, and that's why we record it so you have an opportunity to go back yeah. and review, and you can do the same thing here. Also, and also, Ted, I gotta say it, was, this is good for your brain, man. This is good for your brain. I spend I don't know how much of my day I spend on calls where I can barely keep up or <laughs> fall behind. If I'm not falling behind, I'm not in the right meeting. No, the, the thing is that we had a nice talk last week also and uh, but i was offered a recording well recording is the same thing that i did at lunchtime mm -hmm. i listened to it but i don't have it it's print is very different yeah you know ted if you take notes when you go through it I and you can uh, you can control the speed that I, helps sometimes yeah, I tried that a little bit, but I, he's on to the next subject. I tend to get to the end of the word. Yeah. yeah. I can't take enough notes. Yeah. Well, could Does anybody I, else could, have any other questions? It for, really for is nice to have. I want to turn the tables on you for a minute, Jane and Kim, if I can, ask you some questions. You got a second? <laughs> oh, it's all fair. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so Ollie, if I, when I register for Ollie, I become an HSU student. Yes. I get like a humble.edu email address. I'm now, yes. I got a, I got an ID card. I'm now a student at HSU, right? Yes. Right. Well, not matriculated, you're an extended ed student. So there okay. are, there are some big differences. Okay. So this is something I just learned about recently. Uh, research institutions around the world have a way of sharing their internet access called EduRoam. So that is, if you are registered as a student at Humboldt State, you are now enrolled in an EduRoam account. So if you're in South Africa, outside Johannesburg Research University, you can log in to the internet access there on your EduRoam account that you got from HSU. So my question is, <laughs> if I keep my Ali membership current, can I be in, can I be on EduRoam and get access to internet at any research university in the world? Wow, that is a great question. I, sorry, I don't know the answer to that, but I did write it down, and I will look into that because I am an HSU student, and I pay for my own internet, so I don't I don't know what what's going on with that. But I will look it up, and and I will let you all know. Well, cool. Well, I mentioned that I mentioned that you you know institutions are now looking at delivering their service off campus. So this is part of HSU looking at that too. It's like, right. okay, they can't necessarily pay for internet to every student, but what if they put an EduRoam server at the library? And now if you're off campus and you wanna log in to your account with a fast connection, you can go to a location that has an EduRoam service. And then I started thinking, what? Oh, okay, that's only HSU students. And now it's, and if it's every Ali student, and now I want every K-12 student to get an account. And then, and then, I, and then I want their parents to get accounts. <laughs> anyway. Well, I will definitely look into that and let you all know what I find out. Thanks, Kim. I did bring it up to Josh Callahan, by the way. He's the HSUIT guy, one of the HSUIT people, so. And he didn't know? He, did, I could see his brain started clicking. Nobody's asked for this before. And yeah. it's new to them to even think about reaching off campus. Because what we were talking about was, can we do a project with HSU and Access Humboldt that brings, because HSU has a 10 gig circuit. I mean, they have like more internet than they need and not so many students there anymore. And parts of our community have not enough internet and are looking for some. So we're looking at some cool solutions. Could we pull a circuit from HSU down to, you know, I don't know, Jefferson School and a community where maybe students live and, have a EduRoam service available and parts of, I mean, that makes it work for HSU. For the rest of us, I'd want it to also not require EduRoam, but anyway, that's how we got into the conversation. And to me, that's one thing I love about Humboldt is we have the chance of doing these kind of very innovative cross-sector collaborations that 
when I talk to people around the country, they're not able to do them. Everybody's way too siloed and, you know, turf is all taken up. Well, we have run a little over our, our normal time, um, but if yeah. you still have questions, we'll, we'll, we'll hang on and not, not end the meeting now. But if you do need to leave, feel free to leave. And, um, and, and does anybody else have any questions? All right, well, it doesn't look like it. Um, In which, which case, I want to thank Sean ever so much for all your time and sharing of information and, and soliciting questions and ideas.